you've had many years uh, advising athletes with their finances. What would you, we all talk about the big mistakes. We all hear about, we all see the 30 for 30 when it talks about broke, athletes going broke, you know, not having any money. None of us want to end up like that. I know I don't. So what are some of the biggest mistakes financially um, you see athletes make? You know, I, I think that when you, I, I read an article in uh, USA Today about a few months ago, and it said the five stupidest mistakes that people make in their finances. And I thought to myself, you know what, I wonder what, how could I adapt that to the five, be more graceful, the worst financial mistakes that athletes make? And I asked some of my associates in the company and stuff, what would they say? And you, number one for all of us was this, is that athletes typically have no basis, consistent basis for making financial decisions. They, have, they sim t tend to either model what they saw growing up, or they tend to follow the herd, or the majority or they get opinions from people who have no basis. Let me tell you, the quarterback and the uh, left tackle are not going to help you be financially successful, usually, unless they got the right principles. The majority is never right in anything, people. In business and everything else, the majority is never right. In the Bible, the majority is never right. The majority wanted to go back to Egypt. The majority crucified Christ. The majority was never right. And so what I want to know is, I want to know a consistent way. And for us, this Bible, God said, number one principle is this. If you don't get this, you don't get anything else. God owns it all. Doesn't teach 10% his, 90% mine. He says, I own everything. And I guess what? I'm giving it to you to steward for my purposes. And he would not give us something to steward if he did not give us the principles in, to do, in how to do it. Everything you need to know about money is in here. It's the number one subject in Scripture by far. Nothing, no other subjects even close to money and handling wealth that there is in this Bible. So the number one thing is what happens why people get into problems is they think they're the exception to the principle in Scripture. You're not. Or they just don't know where they're going. And there's, the second worst mistake is this. They never get a plan in place. They never say, hey, what's, where are we going? How long will this money last? If I only play, if it really stands for NFL not for long, what happens if I'm out of the league in three years? Do I have enough money to retrain? Why am I doing this? If I do make a lot of money, then why did God give us this money? And will, it, will I adjust to a lifestyle that I cannot maintain outside the game? And what happens is this. The number one reason you all fight in this room, I'll bet you, is money. I'll bet you it's, it's the leading cause of divorce in this country. And it becomes one of those financial mistakes because people do not have a plan or they go to the world for the advice instead of going right here to where you need that advice from. Um, and the other thing is this. Once people get a plan in place, a lot of players I'll talk to, and so they go, okay, we got a plan in places, they don't stick to it. Solomon says when money increases, so does the people that hang on, and so does your lifestyle. If you don't have a plan, they don't stick to the plan. Most people, the reason why you see the statistics of athletes, including it's not just football. Baseball, it's 60% end up uh, either divorced, unemployed, or broke after the game. Football, it's, they say it's 78%. I don't know if that's true or not. But I would tell you this, that is a real key, is that you get a consistent basis for making that. We're going to talk more about in that workshop. As I give you these problems, we're going to give you the solutions, Ben and Curse and I, as to how to deal with them when you're in the game. Thank you, Don. Oh, I forgot to mention, on your tables... There are handouts, so you can follow along. Don has a lot of information. He's helped us tremendously in our journey. Um, but on your tables, there, there's uh, some sheets so you guys can follow along a little bit. Uh, real estate. We always thought that real estate is always an investment. 2004, I get drafted to the Patriots. Um, 2005, I get married. I'm like, I can't have my wife come home uh, for the first time and not have a nice house, right? You know, get married, got to bring it to a nice house. So I go buy a house in New England in 2004, and... 2005, and any of you know about that real estate market, that was like the height of the real estate market. And then it bust in 2008. So I bought a house, spent way too much for it. 2008, I end up going to Cleveland, and I need to, 2010, and I need to sell it, my house, end up losing a bunch of money on it. Um, and the real estate that I thought was going to be an investment, that's all real estate's always an investment, but it wasn't an investment for me at that point. And we learned a very valuable lesson right then. So now we, we just rent where we go. But real estate, I know you a lot of guys talk about real estate in the locker room, uh, whether it's land or whether it's property or commercial property. Um, what are some of the biggest bad decisions 
that you see people make in the area of real estate. Well, and it's not just athletes, it's everybody in this country, is that they buy, typically buy too much real estate. They take on too much debt with it, and they do never look out and say, hey, what's my out? If I get traded or I had to move or we didn't have the money to sustain this house outside the game, they never ask the question, who's my buyer? Let me tell you something. You buy a million-dollar house, you know how many people in this country can afford or even qualify for a loan for a million-dollar house? Less than 1%. That's your market. Your market isn't the average guy on the street. It's less than 1%. I've had a player, a baseball player last year or a couple years ago, bought a home for his parents in, uh, in Texas. $400,000. Not bad, except he tried to sell it. And he goes, it can't sell. And I asked the real estate, what's wrong? He goes, Don, this is Brownwood, Texas. The average home is 200000 Nobody can afford a $400,000 home, and he had to drop the price of $100,000. You've got to ask the question when you buy a home, can I maintain this home? People, you, you know, what does 16,000 square feet have to do with a home? You're going to have a mansion in heaven. Can you maintain that deal when it's outside the game? Most can't, and that's the trouble. They end up, even if they pay for it for cash, I've seen players who, who they can't afford to maintain the home because of property tax and everything else. Ask the question, what's our out here? And it is, I can prove to you that if you spend less than five years in a home, you're better off renting from a cash flow standpoint. Wait till you find out, hey, what do we want to do with our lives? Um, family and friends. So you get drafted and all of a sudden, I've got one cousin and uh, he's locked up right now. But you get drafted and then you have five, six, seven, eight cousins that you didn't even know were your cousins. And it's amazing how they see your contract in the paper and then you get a little text or you get a call or they call your mom just, just for a little bit just to help them. Just, I just need help yeah. with my rent just, just this month. Just this month. I'll pay you back next right. month. What are the issues with family and friends that you see? What have guys told you about yeah. the, the, you know, giving the, money to family and friends? The mistake number four is this the failure to set boundaries between families and friends. That's the number one problem for athletes. It's when you people flock to my workshop sometimes, it's, that's the number one issue. How do we do this? What's the, what's the problem here? I heard the, uh, read a story recently about an NHL player that uh, it was in the papers and stuff where he, he filed bankruptcy with $50,000 in assets and $10 million in uh, debt. And you know what? The thing is that he may, had made $19 million in his career. And the other problem is that they're gar now garnishing his $5 million salary. You know who his, his advisors were? His parents. His parents borrowed $15 million in his name to do investments. They spent $800,000 in redoing their house, and they took lavish trips, all on his money. I will tell you this. You set boundaries between families and friends. A need, there are needs. The Bible describes a need as food and shelter. That's not, he didn't say meet their need or meet their greeds. He said meet their needs. He goes, hey, there's a problem here. Let me tell you something. For most people, this, they're giving their families relief, but they're not giving them the cure. They're enabling. They're not helping. And what you're doing is it becomes like a welfare system. We're just going to throw money at the problem without saying how do we help people with a job or do something with it. And remember this. If God owns it all, you're entrusting the stewardship of what he's given you to people who may not be worthy of that stewardship. Um, we, as, as people, you have athletes here, you have uh, wives, girlfriends, you have, you know, coaches, chaplains. Um, we all have to deal with money. But as believers, we look at things through a different set of eyes. We should be approaching money uh, differently than the world does. As believers, one of the biggest pitfalls across the board that you see us fall into. You know, I, I think the biggest one for everybody, not just athletes, is, look, you can't go to the USA Today without an article in the money section on people are retiring. The boomer generation, my generation, is re retiring in poverty practically because they failed to look ahead. But as I look at Christians, people who have the word of God, the biggest problem is this. They fall back into the temporary and take their eyes off the eternal. That, that's the problem. There's a guy in Scripture, his name's Demas. He appears three times in Paul's 13 letters. And every two of the times, he is Paul's fellow worker. He's this guy that Paul celebrates. But in 2 Timothy, which would be the last letter Paul would ever write, and he writes it to a young man named Timothy, Paul's in a dungeon getting ready to have his body separated from his head. He is sitting there, and he is instructing Timothy. And he goes in chapter 4 to this one dialogue. He says, Timothy, 
I'm ready to go. I've fought the good fight. I've ran the race. He goes, and therefore there is laid up for me a crown, and not just for me, a crown of righteousness, but for all those who love the Lord's appearing. Paul's focus was eternal. His next words would doom Demas to have his, his name in the Bible in the worst situation for 2,000 years. But Demas, for Demas in love with this present world has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. You see, Demas is with Paul the whole way, and at the end of his life, he goes, hey, man, I'm more in love with this present world. That's what the downfall for most Christians are. They start trying to make this life work rather than the next life. They've lost sense of what Erwin was saying today, the hope of eternity to come, that this life is not all there is. Why do I have this money? You guys are going to ask yourself the question. You're going to have to ask yourself the question because Jesus may ask it to you someday. I made you a very talented person, the most richest time of sports in the history of the world. Do you think I just gave it to you so you could see your name in the press? No, I gave it to you for a reason, to do something with it, to make the difference for all the other 94% of believers in the rest of the world who have nothing, who have, don't have the scriptures, many of them, in their own languages. How I gave it to you, how you could do this. And when you answer that question, you don't end up yourself up in the backwoods of the Bible as having came back in love with the world. I'll tell you, Todd Harper said something the other day in 100X, which I absolutely agree with. He says, I have never seen anybody give themselves, give, outgive themselves into poverty, yet I've seen many people spend themselves into poverty. I've watched it for 35 years. Athletes spend themselves into poverty because they do not have the big outlook on where did you come from? Why are you here? And where are you going? I mean, my goodness, people, we're joint heirs with Jesus. We own it all. We own this whole thing. We don't have to rebuy it all the time. I always tell my clients, I go, man, you, you don't have to own something to enjoy it. I go, I enjoy the heck out of your ranch. You get to shoot your deer and everything else, man. I don't have to own any of it. We're joint heirs. You know, I go, hey, it's not about you owning everything. Because this Bible, the Bible says this is all going to be a big ash pile someday. And Jesus is going to remake it. But my focus has got to come on What's the eternal? You know, where's my destiny? You made a decision at a point in your life that determined where you would spend your eternity. What you do with what you, that decision will determine how you spend eternity there. I want you to do it well. You can do this well and stuff. In our workshop, we're going to answer these questions. <clears throat> the solutions to these five worst problems or worst mistakes that uh, uh, ball players make. I always ask... Uh, uh, and their wives. I always ask uh, a, a, a ball player and, and his wife to join me because they bring reality. And I, I vetted Kirsten and Ben a long time ago that they have done well and learned a lot of lessons that they can share B with team. them. So. B-team. <laughs> so anyways, we're going to enjoy doing that. So, Thank you, Don. Give them a round of applause. applause.